The first major creative response to the Comics Code was the reintroduction of superheroes by existing publishers, DC, and then Timely Comics, which became Marvel. Originally an attempt to accommodate the terms of the code, this response was so successful that with Amazing Spider-Man 96 in 1971, it actually weakened the code's legitimacy, giving Marvel the authority to print issues about drug use without the Comics Code seal. At the same time, there was another response, a second response, known as Underground Comics. Underground Comics, even more than EC, even more than superhero comics, demonstrate my thesis that art is not pure. But more than that, they demonstrate the simple truth that it is good to make art, that individuals can simply publish their work and make a difference. The story of Underground Comics begins exactly where EC's genre fiction leaves off, with Mad Magazine. Here is the cover of October 1954, a few short months after Bill Gaines' humiliating deposition in front of the U.S. Senate. Mad. Humor in a jugular vein. Comic book raid. As a result of charges that certain comic books are contributing to crime, these comic book artists were rounded up today at their hideout where they had stored a sizable cache of brushes, drawing paper, and ink. From right to left, they are a crime cartoonist, a science fiction cartoonist, and a lampoon cartoonist. Comics go underground. In this remarkable photo, we see a comic book publisher whose books have been banned from the newsstand secretly peddling his comics on a busy street corner. The cover stakes overt resistance to authority. Indeed, it sets the terms for underground comics. Its editor, Harvey Kurtzman, published this and then moved on to do Help Magazine, which, which continued the same satirical lampooning sense and picked up many of the EC artists and writers. The absolute defining statement of underground comics, however, is made by Robert Crumb in Zap One in 1968. Here's the cover, and you can see on it a little old lady in a kind of shoe buggy drives into town. The page is filled with the tropes of comics. Trope, you'll remember, means turn. It's the use of an existing figure of speech to other ends. And here we see it most clearly in the upper right hand corner where Crumb has drawn in a kind of comic book seal of approval of his own. It says, approved by the ghostwriters in the sky. In a sense he's saying, I resist the comic book code. I don't care. But then, in the very top of the left-hand corner of the heading, fair warning for adult intellectuals only. The cover is thus a satirical response to the code, but also a reasoned statement that it stands apart from the audience that the code was intending to protect. Below that, Apex Novelties. Apex Publishing was started by Don Donahue, who asked Charles Plumel, a beat poet, to use his printing press, and so printed up Zap Comics. In fact, legend has it that Crumb's wife loaded the prints of Zap Comics into her baby carriage and peddled it, almost like that cover of Mad Magazine, peddled it on the corner of Haight and Ashbury, the epicenter of the 1960s counterculture movement. Crumb, in fact, had drawn an entirely different comic to introduce Zap. Zap Comics, the comic that plugs you in. I think this cover, the original cover, effectively communicates Crumb's intent much better because it zaps the reader. The reader reading Zap in his hands, in his embryonic position, are in front of him as if reading, but instead he's plugged directly into the main line of electrical current. Zap! Crumb's sheets for this comic were absconded by his original publisher, who took them to Europe. Crumb ended up using Xeroxes later to print number zero, which came out as the third edition of Zap. The initial Zap hit the stands like this, because here we see the little old lady 
and Crumb's iconic Mr. Natural, his hippie guru prophet, who he traces through a number of his comics. The little old lady says, I wish somebody would tell me what diddy wa diddy means. If you don't know by now, lady, don't mess with it. The cover sets out some terms. What's going on in this world? If you don't know, don't ask. And this is recreated by the chunky man on the street who's walking along who says, is this a system? In effect, he's asking the same thing as the little old lady. Is this a system? What's going on? There's a posting on the fence on the left-hand side. Hey, get it? It's the same question. Is this organized or is it not? What's going on here? There's a sense of whether it's an informed, tight system or whether it's a loose happening of sorts, an event that has no fixed parameters. And so we bounce along coming into this world of underground comics, much like the little old lady in the shoe, bouncing along on her buggy's wheels that mimic the typeface of Zap overall. What I'm suggesting then is that the counterculture movement is woven in, is woven in to comics tropes overall. And nowhere do we see that more clearly than on the back cover of Zap One. Just look at the amazing results. Betty Doxy of Utica, New York writes us, I've been turning on for only six months, but I still can't believe the difference. Wow. And there she is before, and there she is after. The old Betty, caught up in boring, uptight social games, alienated, frustrated, waiting for something she knew not what. New Betty is uninhibited, ecstatic, flower child, turned on, stoned out, excited about the now. And so can you. It's easy as pie, lots of fun. See for yourself. Would it be too much to say that Crumb's inviting us to color in, to tune in, and to then tune out? I'll read one more. Here's Joel Douche from Cleveland, Ohio. I was just a nice Jewish boy with all kinds of middle-class hang-ups. I'm damn glad I started using stuff. And believe me, it's only the beginning. Zap Comics plays upon comics' virulent nature and points it, points it to the counterculture movement of the 60s. It says... This may be an overall system, or it may not, but plug in and it will loosen you up. And so, Underground Comics found its chief spokesperson. But this was not the first Underground Comics. Zap Comics wasn't the first. Indeed, apparently the first Underground Comics was by Jack Jackson, who produced God Knows, spelled like a nose, which he terms adult comics and he produced it after work at the Texas State Capitol Xerox machine in 1964. Crumb however, Crumb defines the movement overall and he started in Cleveland, Ohio, not unlike Joel Douche who plugged in on the back of Zap One, and working for American Greeting Cards. He was such a great greeting card artist that American greeting cards let him take his work out of the office. And so he traveled across the country coming to San Francisco, where he met others in the counterculture movement who he worked with. And this, to me, defines in many ways the counterculture sense that Crumb there found a way, found a way to shape himself within the community. Opening that first page of Zap One, we can see how Crumb used comics to create for himself a persona of the artiste. I'll read to you here. Definitely a case of derangement. My wife cringes in the corner while I stalk the house, a raving lunatic. Ridiculous, I want my money back, fooey, crepes, nuts, cancel my rumble lessons. From the bedroom closet, I operate a huge network of radios, sending out incantations, curses, voodoo, hoodoo. I've been called an evil genius by cities of assholes, but I know who these people are, and they're on my list. I may be nuts, but a speed freak, I ain't. The truth is, I'm one of the world's great medieval thinkers. You might say I'm a mad scientist, 
for my plans have all been worked out quite methodically, logically. But the ends justify the means. <laughs> this comic book is part of that plan. But you've already read too much. Already. I have you right where I want you. So kichi cool, you bastards. Go right on to the next page. November 1967 by R. Crumb. What I want to suggest is that Crumb is aware not just that the counterculture movement approximates an organized system, but also that he inhabits that system as an artist. That he is not simply Robert from Ohio, Cleveland, but he's R. Crumb. He's an artist. That gives him a way to speak to a community overall. And that's what the underground movement ultimately was. It was a community that's found its voice in the anthologies that it created. And so, underground comics appeared in the East Village Other, counterculture political newspaper. They built their own anthologies, such as Feds and Heads, by Gilbert Shelton, working out of Austin, Texas in 1968. Jay Lynch was in Chicago and created the Bijou Funnies with Pat and Nard. Bill Griffith and Art Spiegelman started in New York, and here's their cover of Young Lust, in which parodies the exact kind of romance comics that Kirby and Simon created in the late 50s. There's Trina Robbins' women's comics, also out of San Francisco in 1972. My point is... All these comics came out of individuals desiring to express what they saw around them, desiring to express their community and their identity in that community. And so Underground Comics was born. It was born of individual effort, individual drawing and writing, and individual associations. But it became larger than that. So I say, I say, it's good to make art because in art, you can craft yourself larger than one individual. You can craft your community and your statement.